Chapter 24 Tars Tarkas Finds a Friend About noon I passed low over a great dead city of ancient Mars, and as I skimmed out across the plain beyond I came full upon several thousand green warriors engaged in a terrific battle. Scarcely had I seen them than a volley of shots was directed at me, and with the almost unfailing accuracy of their aim my little craft was instantly a ruined wreck, sinking erratically to the ground. I fell almost directly in the center of the fierce combat, among warriors who had not seen my approach, so busily were they engaged in life-and-death struggles. The men were fighting on foot with long-swords while an occasional shot from a sharpshooter on the outskirts of the conflict would bring down a warrior who might for an instant separate himself from the entangled mass. As my machine sank among them I realized that it was fight or die, with good chances of dying in any event, and so I struck the ground with drawn longsword ready to defend myself as I could. I fell beside a huge monster who was engaged with three antagonists, and as I glanced at his fierce face, filled with the light of battle, I recognized Tars Tarkas the Thark. He did not see me, as I was a trifle behind him, and just then the three warriors opposing him and whom I recognized as Warhoons charged simultaneously. The mighty fellow made quick work of one of them, but in stepping back for another thrust he fell over a dead body behind him and was down and at the mercy of his foes in an instant quick as lightning they were upon him, and Tars Tarkas would have been gathered to his fathers in short order had I not sprung before his prostrate form and engaged his adversaries. I had accounted for one of them when the mighty Thark regained his feet and quickly settled the other. He gave me one look, and a slight smile touched his grim lip, as, touching my shoulder, he said, "'I would scarcely recognize you, John Carter but there is no other mortal upon Barsoom who would have done what you have done for me. I think I have learned that there is such a thing as friendship, my friend." He said no more, nor was there opportunity, for the Warhoons were closing in about us, and together we fought, shoulder to shoulder, during all that long, hot afternoon, until the tide of battle turned and the remnant of the fierce Warhoon horde fell back upon their thoats and fled into the gathering darkness. Ten thousand men had been engaged in that titanic struggle, and upon the field of battle lay three thousand dead. Neither side asked or gave quarter, nor did they attempt to take prisoners. On our return to the city after the battle we had gone directly to Tars Tarkas' quarters, where I was left alone while the chieftain attended the customary council which immediately follows an engagement. As I sat awaiting the return of the green warrior, I heard something move in an adjoining apartment, and as I glanced up there rushed suddenly upon me a huge and hideous creature which bore me backward upon the pile of silks and furs upon which I had been reclining. It was Woola, faithful, loving Woola. He had found his way back to Thark, and, as Tars Tarkas later told me, had gone immediately to my former quarters where he had taken up his pathetic and seemingly hopeless watch for my return. "'Dalhagis knows that you are here, John Carter,' said Tars Tarkas, on his return from the Jeddak's quarters. "'Sarkoja saw and recognized you as we were returning. Talhajus has ordered me to bring you before him tonight. I have ten thoats, John Carter. You may take your choice from among them and I will accompany you to the nearest waterway that leads to Helium. Tars Tarkas may be a cruel green warrior, but he can be a friend as well. Come, we must start." "'And when you return, Tars Tarkas?' I asked. "'The wild Kalots, possibly, or worse,' he replied. "'Unless I should chance to have the opportunity I have so long waited of battling with Tal Hajis. We will stay, Tars Tarkas, and see Talhajus tonight. You shall not sacrifice yourself, and it may be that tonight you can have the chance you wait." He objected strenuously, saying that Talhajus often flew into wild fits of passion at the mere thought of the blow I had dealt him, 
and that if ever he laid his hands upon me I would be subjected to the most horrible tortures. While we were eating, I repeated to Tars Tarkas the story which Sola had told me that night upon the sea-bottom during the march to Thark. He said but little, but the great muscles of his face worked in passion, and in the agony at recollection of the horrors which had been heaped upon the only thing he had ever loved in all his cold, cruel, and terrible existence. He no longer demurred when I suggested that we go before Talhajis, only saying that he would like to speak to Sarkoja first. At his request I accompanied him to her quarters, and the look of venomous hatred she cast upon me was almost adequate recompense for any future misfortunes this accidental return to Thark might bring me. "'Sarkoja,' said Tars Tarkas, forty years ago you were instrumental in bringing about the torture and death of a woman named Gozava. I have just discovered that the warrior who loved that woman has learned of your part in the transaction. He may not kill you, Sarkoja, it is not our custom but there is nothing to prevent him tying one end of a strap about your neck and the other end to a wild throat, merely to test your fitness to survive and help perpetuate our race. Having heard that he would do this on the morrow, I thought it only right to warn you, for I am a just man. The river Is is but a short pilgrimage, Sarkoja. Come, John Carter." The next morning Sarkoja was gone nor was she ever seen after. In silence we hastened to the Jeddak's palace, where we were immediately admitted to his presence. In fact, he could scarcely wait to see me, and was standing erect upon his platform, glowering at the entrance as I came in. "'Strap him to that pillar!' he shrieked. "'We shall see who it is dare strike the mighty Tal Hajus. Heat the irons!' With my own hands I shall burn the eyes from his head, that he may not pollute my person with his vile gaze." "'Chieftains of Thark!' I cried, turning to the assembled council and ignoring Tal Hajus. "'I have been a chief among you, and today I have fought for Thark, shoulder to shoulder, with her greatest warrior. You owe me at least a hearing. I have won that much today. You claim to be a just people. Silence! roared Tal Hajus. Gag the creature and bind him as I command. Justice, Tal Hajus! exclaimed Lord Quas Tomel. Who are you to set aside the customs of ages among the Tharks? Yes, justice! echoed a dozen voices. And so, while Tal Hajus fumed and frothed, I continued. You are a brave people, and you love bravery. But where was your mighty Jeddak during the fighting today? I did not see him in the thick of battle. He was not there. He rends defenseless women and little children in his lair, but how recently has one of you seen him fight with men? Why, even I, a midget beside him, felled him with a single blow of my fist. Is it of such that the Tharks fashion their Jeddaks? There stands beside me now a great Thark a mighty warrior and a noble man. Chieftains, how sounds Tars Tarkas, Jeddak of Thark!" A roar of deep-toned applause greeted this suggestion. It but remains for this council to command, and Tal Hajus must prove his fitness to rule. Were he a brave man, he would invite Tars Tarkas to combat, for he does not love him, but Tal Hajus is afraid. Tal Hajus, your Jeddak, is a coward. With my bare hands I could kill him, and he knows it." After I ceased there was tense silence, as all eyes were riveted upon Tal Hajus. He did not speak or move, but the blotchy green of his countenance turned livid, and the froth froze upon his lips. "'Tal Hajus,' said Lorquas Tomel in a cold, hard voice, Never in my long life have I seen a Jeddak of the Thark so humiliated. There could be but one answer to this arraignment. We wait it." And still Talhajus stood, as though electrified. "'Chieftains,' continued Lorcas Tomel, 
Shall the Jeddak, Talhajis, prove his fitness to rule over Tars Tarkas? There were twenty chieftains about the rostrum, and twenty swords flashed high in assent. There was no alternative. The decree was final, and so Tal Hajis drew his long sword and advanced to meet Tars Tarkas. The combat was soon over, and with his foot upon the neck of the dead monster, Tars Tarkas became Jeddak among the Tharks. His first act was to make me a full-fledged chieftain with the rank I had won by my combats the first few weeks of my captivity among them. Seeing the favorable disposition of the warriors towards Tars Tarkas as well as toward me, I grasped the opportunity to enlist them in my cause against Zodanga. I told Tars Tarkas the story of my adventures, and in a few words had explained to him the thought I had in mind. John Carter has made me a proposal," he said, addressing the Council, which meets with my sanction. I shall put it to you briefly. Deja Thoris, the Princess of Helium, who was our prisoner, is now held by the Jeddak of Zodanga, whose son she must wed to save her country from devastation at the hands of the Zodangan forces. John Carter suggests that we rescue her and return her to Helium. The loot of Zodanga would be magnificent, and I have often thought that had we an alliance with the people of Helium we could obtain sufficient assurance of sustenance to permit us to increase the size and frequency of our hatchings, and thus become unquestionably supreme among the green men of all Barsoom. What say you?" It was a chance to fight, an opportunity to loot and they rose to the bait as a speckled trout to a fly. For Tharks they were wildly enthusiastic, and before another half-hour had passed twenty mounted messengers were speeding across dead sea-bottoms to call the hordes together for the expedition. In three days we were on the march toward Zodanga, one hundred thousand strong, as Tars Tarkas had been able to enlist the services of three smaller hordes on the promise of the great loot of Zodanga. At the head of the column I rode beside the great Thark, while at the heels of my mount trotted my beloved Wula. We traveled entirely by night, timing our marches so that we camped during the day at deserted cities, where, even to the beasts, we were all kept indoors during the daylight hours. On the march, Tars Tarkas, through his remarkable ability and statesmanship, enlisted fifty thousand more warriors from various hordes, so that, ten days after we set out, we halted at midnight outside the great walled city of Zodanga, one hundred and fifty thousand strong. The fighting strength and efficiency of this horde of ferocious green monsters was equivalent to ten times their number of red men. Never in the history of Barsoom, Tars Tarkas told me, had such a force of green warriors marched to battle together. It was a monstrous task to keep even a semblance of harmony among them, and it was a marvel to me that we got them to the city without a mighty battle among themselves. But as we neared Zodanga their personal quarrels were submerged by their greater hatred for the red men, and especially for the Zodangans who had for years waged a ruthless campaign of extermination against the green men, directing special attention toward despoiling their incubators. Now that we were before Zodanga, the task of obtaining entry to the city devolved upon me, and directing Tars Tarkas to hold his forces in two divisions out of earshot of the city, with each division opposite a large gateway, I took twenty dismounted warriors and approached one of the small gates that pierced the walls at short intervals. These gates have no regular guard, but are covered by sentries, who patrol the avenue that encircles the city just within the walls, as our metropolitan police patrol their beats. The walls of Zodanga are seventy-five feet in height and fifty feet thick. They are built of enormous blocks of carborundum and the task of entering the city seemed to my escort of green warriors an impossibility. The fellows who had been detailed to accompany me were of one of the smaller hordes, and therefore did not know me. 
placing three of them with their faces to the wall and arms locked, I commanded two more to mount to their shoulders, and a sixth I ordered to climb upon the shoulders of the upper two. The head of the topmost warrior towering over forty feet from the ground. In this way, with ten warriors, I built a series of three steps from the ground to the shoulders of the topmost man. Then, starting from a short distance behind them, I ran swiftly up from one tier to the next, and with a final bound from the broad shoulders of the highest, I clutched the top of the great wall, and quietly drew myself to its broad expanse. After me I dragged six lengths of leather from an equal number of my warriors. These lengths we had previously fastened together, and passing one end to the topmost warrior, I lowered the other end cautiously over the opposite side of the wall toward the avenue below. No one was in sight, so lowering myself to the end of my leather strap I dropped the remaining thirty feet to the pavement below. I had learned from Kanto's Khan the secret of opening these gates, and in another moment my twenty great fighting men stood within the doomed city of Zodanga. I found to my delight that I had entered at the lower boundary of the enormous palace grounds. The building itself showed in the distance a blaze of glorious light, and on the instant I determined to lead a detachment of warriors directly within the palace itself while the balance of the great horde was attacking the barracks of the soldiery. Dispatching one of my men to Tars Tarkas for a detail of fifty tharks, with word of my intentions, I ordered ten warriors to capture and open one of the great gates, while with the nine remaining I took the other. We were to do our work quietly. No shots were to be fired, and no general advance made until I had reached the palace with my fifty tharks. Our plans worked to perfection. The two sentries we met were dispatched to their fathers upon the banks of the Lost Sea of Chorus, and the guards at both gates followed them in silence. End of chapter 24